Good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's uh, Torah study on the book of Tanya. Uh, I'd like to uh, make sure that we have our uh, people joining us here. I'm going to just post the group. I'm back on now. With, I'm just posting it to our group. Um, um, hopefully, we can get people back on. Uh, my battery ran out before, and I had to plug it back in. Hi, Richard. Good to see you. Um, let's see who else. Um, who else do we have here? I should have post on Tanya Group. Okay. Okay, good. Um, let's see. Okay, good. Fine. So we're studying Tanya. Now, we study this book of Tanya every single week for the past couple of years. Um, it is a game changer um, on philosophy. Truly a game changer on philosophy because we're starting a new format here, because we're doing this online. I'm going to have to take a few steps back right now to make sure that people will get the opportunity to be able to study this Tanya and get a perspective. I need to make almost a, a reset, you know, even though we've, we've actually reached uh, chapter 22 in the book of Tanya. I want to give a quick introduction and explain to you what's going on over here, what this book is about, and how this book is going to change your perspective on reality. So Tanya is a book that was written 250 years ago by the founder of the Chabad movement, Rabbi Schneir Zalman of Liad. Rabbi Shir Zalmaliadi was the founder of the Chabad movement um, and a brilliant sage. I'm going to show you a picture of him. Here's what it looks like. That's a picture of Rabbi Shneir Zalman of Liadi, the founder of the Book of Tanya. And if you would like, you can actually uh, find the Book of Tanya online. Oh, not this. Um, here. Uh, you can find it online if you go to, I'm going to post it in the comments right now where you can find a link to the book of Tanya. Find the book Tanya online. So this way it's in the Tanya. It's on our website. Um, I'm posting it right now so you can find it. Um, hopefully you'll be able to experience the book of Tanya over there. Um, but so what Tanya did is that it changed our approach to God. You see, there's, there's two reasons why the book of Tanya was revealed to humanity. Tanya is a study of godliness. It's Jewish mysticism. It's not Jewish mysticism as it is perceived by human beings. Tanya is Jewish mysticism the way it was given to us by God. So that's why it's very, very different to the self-help section in uh, Barnes & Noble. This is not just another human approach to dealing with our problems. It is God's guidance. It is God's guidance as to how, as to how we can, as to how we can um, uh, find our purpose in this world. Now, the reason that the Book of Tanya was revealed to us in, 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 this, in this era, in the past 250 years, is for two reasons. The more time goes by, the further we go from Moses and from Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, and Leah. We are moving further and further away from godly revelation. You know, there's a cute story of a guy in an airplane, an old, uh, an old rabbi who's traveling with his, with his grandchildren. And... Uh, a secular person sitting next to him can't help but notice how respectful the grandchildren are of their grandfather. Zayda, can I bring you water? Zayda, are you comfortable? Zayda this, Zayda that. They're constantly caring for and doting for their grandfather. At one point in the flight, this secular person turns to the rabbi and he says, you know, I have to tell you, my grandchildren would never treat me the way your grandchildren treat you. They're not nearly as respectful. They, 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 
they're nauseated by me. Why would they want to spend time with me? And I see your grandchildren, are, 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 they revere you. Why is that? Said the rabbi, he said, look, you know, you teach your, your, your children and grandchildren about evolution probably, right? Yeah, good. So you tell them about evolution. The way they see you, therefore, is that you are two generations closer to the monkeys and the apes and the orangutans. And they are two generations more advanced, more sophisticated, and more developed. So they look at you as a dinosaur, as a prehistoric, archaic, irrelevant, but to me, I don't teach my children about uh, evolution. I tell them about God and Mount Sinai and Moses and Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. To me, they look at me in awe and they say, oh my gosh, Zayda is two generations closer to God revealing himself in Mount Sinai. We're two generations later. We can connect to Sinai through our Zayda. So it's a very powerful perspective. It gives you on reality and, and on your uh, relationship with your grandchildren if you want them to respect you. But the point here is, and the reason why I'm sharing the story is because the more time goes by, the further we go into the darkness of this exile. And the more, when I say darkness of this exile, the more godliness is concealed and hidden. You know, a thousand years ago, we had great luminaries, holy people. They were able to inspire and, and, and lead us. But today, who do we have to inspire us? We're kind of groping in the spiritual darkness. This is the reason that the book of Tanya was revealed to us in the past 250 years because we're so deep in the exile that we need the big guns to help us find the light. And that's what the book of Tanya is. It is godly wisdom about our purpose in this world, guidance from God about, how, about the purpose of our lives, how we can find our way in this darkness. A second reason why the Tanya was revealed in this generation, in this time, is because there's a special mitzvah before Shabbat. You know, Shabbat is supposed to invest in the pleasures of Shabbos. He's supposed to buy special food for Shabbos and buy special dishes and then make sure there's a special ambiance and atmosphere in the home. I got to tell you, if you don't yet observe Shabbat in your home, you don't know what you're missing. Shabbos is the most beautiful, elevated, majestic experience. All week long, we are slaves to our cell phone. We are slaves to the stimuli around us, to Fox and to CNN and to this election and to that political candidate and to the stock market and to this, that and the other. Comes Shabbos and it's just, leave me alone. Everything is off. There's just me, my faith and my family. That's it. Shabbos is a total... USA shutdown. It's just me and my God and my family. It's the most beautiful, precious experience. My, our six-year-old son actually said to us this Shabbos as we were just sitting in the backyard relaxing. He says, you know, mommy and Tati, I love Shabbos. So we asked him why. And he said, I love Shabbos because you and, you and Tati are not in your cell phones. Can you imagine how that hurts? <laughs> so Shabbos is the most beautiful experience. You're supposed to invest in Shabbos and to, to, you know, to prepare a Shabbos dinner Friday night. Make sure you have a meal at home. Light the candles. Make Kiddush. Have some special food. Have the family come together. Make sure that you don't have any cell phones around. No TVs blaring. No internet allowed. Just a family. Just eye, eye contact. It's the most beautiful experience. But before Shabbos, you're supposed to have a delicacy of Shabbos. You're supposed to have a foretaste. Just a little taste. Like an appetizer before Shabbos. Just like it is with our weekly Shabbat that we're supposed to have a foretaste of the Shabbos to, to let us come in with an appetizer, you know, with our uh, salivating. So too it is with the global, the cosmic Shabbat. We now are in the year 5,780 since the creation of the world. Since for God, every 1,000 years of human beings is one day for God. This is a principle in Judaism. 1,000 years for us is one day for God. I guess it's like dog years. Is it seven, year, seven dog years is one human year or something like that? So 1,000 so 1, human years is one day for God, which means if we are the first 1,000 years of the world was Sunday, the second 1,000 was Monday, the third 1,000 is Tuesday and so on. And now that we're in 5,780, that means that by the time we hit the year 6,000, we are entering the seventh millennium, which means we're entering Saturday, which is Shabbos, which means right now we are standing late on a Friday afternoon on God's watch right now. It is about 6.47 or 7 p.m. on a Friday afternoon. It is dangerously close to the onset of Shabbos. 
Shabbos, of course, is the coming of Mashiach. Mashiach is an era when godliness will be revealed. In the words of Isaiah, and, the, and all fleshly eye will see that the word of God is spoken. We will see the word of God in every single We'll see the word of God in every single thing. You'll see that we, we spoke earlier in the previous class about the doctrine of perpetual creation, how God needs to create the world at every single moment in time. We will see on the subatomic level the godly energy creating every single thing in this world. I guess it's a lot like coronavirus where you can see and you're cognizant, you're aware of the virus in your saliva and the virus in the handshake and in the, the doorknob. You're aware of, of, of all this, you know, invisible stuff, I guess the coming of Mashiach is an awareness or maybe even more of a greater perception, a visual of the divine presence that's creating every single thing that exists, not only visual, but also audio. You, it's like a song. You'll be able to hear the orchestra, the harmony of God's speaking or singing every single thing into creation. It's going to be an extraordinary experience. And that's what happens in the, the, when Mashiach comes, which is on Shabbos. But before Shabbos, he's supposed to have a foretaste. So a foretaste of Mashiach is the revelation of divine secrets of godly mysticism. This is why we have the book of Tanya. And if you've just joined us, we're learning now the book of Tanya. Here's a picture of the author. He's the first Chabad Rebbe, Rabbi Shneer Zalman of Li'adi. He happens to be my grandfather nine generations ago also. Um, but Rabbi Shneer Zalman of Li'adi was the first Chabad Rebbe and he was an absolutely brilliant man, a mystical sage who was able to access the wisdom that was taught from Moses by, to Moses on Mount Sinai and passed down from generation to generation to generation the secrets of Kabbalah. And what he did was is that he encapsulated the wisdom of the mysticism, of Jewish mysticism, of Kabbalah into a way that is intelligible to us ordinary people. And that's what Chabad is. Chabad is, the word Chabad actually means logic. It means logic. In a previous class I explained it's the three levels of logic, but generally Chabad means logic and the purpose of Chabad is to make our divine relationship with God logical, something that we can relate to and experience. That's what the book of Tanya is. So when we are so close to the cosmic Shabbat, and the reason why we were given the book of Tanya is in order to give us a foretaste of the godly revelation that will take place when the Shia comes. And that's what we're about to experience right here, right now, as we start to study the Tanya in Facebook. So folks, uh, please post your comments on the uh, side of here. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, hi, Daniel. I'm not sure if you're in New York or in Florida, but it's great to have you with us. Um, we'd love to see your uh, comments. And again, if you want the Book of Tanya for yourself, you can see I posted a link to the Book of Tanya. It's free on our website. You can actually experience this Book of Tanya. It's a five-volume set. Um, we now are actually going to be doing Chapter 22 in the Book of Tanya. But... I'm not sure if in today's session I'm really going to be able to get into chapter 22 as much as I'm going to have to give a more of a general introduction to our online audience because we're going to do this every week on Tuesday mornings um, about about 9.15ish. So what's the time now? Yeah, whatever. Okay, so the book of Tanya is more specifically a path to self-mastery. I'm going to try to summarize the first 22 chapters of Tanya right here, maybe in five minutes. So in order to experience self-mastery, you need to be able to know who you are and what you're made up of. So Tanya tells us fascinating revelation. Besides for the obvious, which is the physical body, you know, the two eyes, two ears, ten fingers, and ten toes that we all know that we have, we also have a soul which gives us life. And when we understand the nature of the soul, the pathology of the soul, and the needs of the soul, we'll be able to experience far greater and elevated sense, sense of happiness and purpose and fulfillment. So the first mind-blowing revelation of Tanya in chapter 2 is that not only, no, it's actually chapter 1, not only do we have one soul, we actually have two souls. And these souls are in a tug of war. Before we can understand the comp competition between the two souls, we have to understand really what they are. So what is the soul? The soul is spiritual. It is what keeps us alive. When you're sleeping, your soul goes up to heaven. 
it's like a cell phone being plugged into the wall. It's you know not mobile anymore. But when you wake up, you take the cell phone, you're now recharged. Our soul is recharged, comes back from heaven, comes down to this world, and re re-inhabits the body to give us life for another day. We actually thank God for this every morning when we say, we say, God, I thank you. And the, the first thing you do when you wake up in the morning, you're supposed to go like this. It's the only time we pray like this. We go, we say, I thank you. Um, oh, great and manifold king. Shachazar, that you have restored my soul within me. Great is your faithfulness. And what we mean by that is great is your faithfulness. Not that we are, uh, not that you are faithful, we can rely on you, but great is your faithfulness that you believe in me. I'm shocked that you believe in me for another day to give me life for another 24 hours. That you deemed me worthy despite all my mistakes yesterday, that you deemed me worthy of infusing your essence, your soul, your life force within me to give me a life for another day. I, every morning I wake up, I'm like, wow, God, I can't believe that you believe in me for another day to think that I've, I have, uh, um, you know, you believe in me. That's amazing. I can't wait to find out why. <laughs> so that's what we say every single morning. Now, that soul that is restored within us, Hi, Ariel Stern from Montreal, Canada. Great to have you with us. I just saw your brother, my brother-in-law, in South Africa last week. And mazel tov to you on the bris. So, um, so what is our soul? We're talking, if you just tuned in, by the way, we're studying the book of Tanya. We do this every Tuesday morning. We're up to chapter 22. But this book is the essence of Chabad Hasidic philosophy. And since we're going online during coronavirus, we're giving you more of an introduction to the book of Tanya. So what is the soul? The soul is a piece of divine energy. It's a piece of God. And it's divided into two general categories. One is logical, the other one is feeling. One is what we understand, and the other one is how we feel. So in other words, love. Is love a physical thing? Obviously, love is not a physical thing. Love is a soul experience. Hate is a soul experience. Wisdom is a soul experience. Music is a soul experience. Food is a body experience. Anything which you can capture in the five senses, taste, hearing, touch, smell, and feel, I think it is, right? Uh, anything which you can capture in the five senses is physical, like food or um, exercise. But anything which you cannot capture in a physical sense, like meth or wisdom, or love, or hate, or compassion, is all a soul experience. Now, the question is, we, we, we can understand, we all know that we have love and hate, and we have uh, feelings and understanding, that is all part of our soul. But we actually have no one but two souls. Two souls. One soul is an animalistic soul. It's a selfish soul. It's self-centered. It's like an animal in the sense that it doesn't have a higher purpose. It just wants to self-preserve. That's all it wants to do. Nothing wrong with that. It's like an animal that wants to eat, drink, sleep, and procreate. Our animal soul just wants to eat, drink, sleep, and procreate. It wants to self-serve. But then you have a second soul, which is a piece of God. It's the godly soul. And this soul is not self-centered. It's not self-centered. It's God-centered. This soul does not ask, what can the world do for me? This second soul asks, what can I do for the world? What can I do? Sorry, what can I do for God? Why was I placed in this world? And you can just imagine that these two souls within us are in constant conflict. Your animal soul wants to just experience pleasure. Your godly soul wants to experience purpose. So whenever you find yourself in a state of conflict, you have some extra money and you're trying to decide, so should we spend this money on a cruise or should we give it to Chabad for charity, right? You might experience a conflict. Your animal soul has spent the pleasure to do it on a cruise. But godly soul is donated to charity, right? Let's focus on purpose and on pleasure. And this is a constant struggle we are experiencing all the time. And the book of Tanya, in the first nine chapters, tells us much more detail. I've done this very, very general. Much more detail about how we are, about what is our spiritual makeup. Now, Tanya then proceeds to go into the a long way and a short way to self-mastery. 
The long way to self-mastery is by engaging or employing the natural resource that we have, which is our brain, our power of mindfulness over our instincts. If you were to meditate upon your purpose, then you would be able to control the impulses of your heart. That's basically what the long way to self-mastery is in the book of Tanya, which means when you are, are taking the time to educate yourself to your purpose in this world, which means to be aware of the game players, who is in this game, there's me and there's God, and then there's my purpose in this world, and to educate yourself as to what the purpose is in this world, you'll have a choice of whether you want to be myopic, which means to focus on the here and now and the pleasure that's right in front of me, or you want to focus on the bigger picture, which is the reason why I was put into this world in the first place, to be able to say, it's not about my pleasure, it's about my purpose. And that, that way you're able to come to a state of self-mastery where your godly soul is able to overcome and dominate over your animalistic, self, selfish soul, where your selfless soul overcomes your selfish soul. God-centered soul is able to rule, you rule over your self-centered soul. But then we learned there's a shortcut method to self-mastery, and that is where we're in now, we're in the middle of this now in our weekly Talmud, uh, sorry, our weekly Tanya study. And that is how we are supposed to reach a shortcut method to self-mastery. See, not everybody is uh, intellectually inclined. And not everybody is able to really focus for a very long period of time. And not everybody even has the resources about what they're supposed to be meditating on, to thinking on, in order to come to a state of self-mastery. So what what Tanya does in chapters 18 through 25 is it gives us a shortcut method of a, a way for us to be able to come to terms with our, um, to overcome our animalistic soul, our self-centered soul in a way that doesn't require too much of, um, too much uh, meditation, something which is more unleashing a natural resource that we have. So now, uh, I'm not sure I've got a text message or from Corey about losing me. I'm not sure if you lost me um, intellectually or you lost internet connection. Folks, uh, please do feel free to uh, comment over here. I would love to hear your thoughts. I, you know, you can imagine it's not easy talking into a computer screen um, during coronavirus without the ability to uh, engage with people. I see we have 16 people in this class right now, 22 people in this class, but I don't, um, I would love to hear your thoughts. I see Richard once led a cruise on a Friday night. That's great, Richard. I've always believed in your power to uh, be a leader in the Jewish community, wherever you are. But please, folks, uh, do share your thoughts and comments over here with me because uh, it's otherwise difficult for me to know if you're following me or not, especially when we're studying Tanya, which is something so profound and something so deep. So the way that... The way that we come to a natural state of self-mastery without working too hard. By the way, just one more thing I want to say to you is that if you just join me, we, we're studying Tanya here. This is the, bo the, Jewish, the book to Chabad philosophy. If you want to know what makes Chabadnik so passionate and so dynamic and um, um, th then you've got to really study the book of Tanya. Tanya is God's gift to our generation which allows us in these very spiritually dark times to be inspired with godly wisdom as to our purpose in this world. It, it incorporates tremendous amounts of meditation, extraordinary uh, nuggets and pearls of wisdom, which we can meditate upon that really is able to lift us up from the, the daily grind and the, the harsh realities of life to be able to pick us up to a higher purpose. It's very, very beautiful stuff. And uh, that's what we're going to be learning about right now. So let me get straight into it over here about uh, the study of what we're learning today in the book of Tanya, which is a shortcut method as how we can reach a state of self-mastery, of allowing our godly soul to rule over our animal soul. In other words, to make sure that our thought, speech, and action is consistent with the will and desire of our purpose-driven soul, godly soul, as opposed to being our thought, speech, and action being aligned with the will and desire of our self-centered soul 
which is our animalistic soul, making sure that our lives are consistent with purpose more than them being cons uh, con uh, um, aligned with pleasure. Now, the way to do this is that the Alter Rebbe tells us that when God gave us the Ten Commandments, there were only only the first two commandments were told to us by God. Only the first two commandments were told to us by God. Everything else was told to us by Moses. What actually happened was that the moment God spoke, we all literally died. Can you imagine what would happen if um, you have little flames of fire, little candles, and you bring a giant bonfire near the flames of fire? What's going to happen? Is that the little tiny flames are going to jump over into the bonfire? So what happened was when you have all these little souls, you have millions and millions of Jewish Jewish people around the Mount Sinai, and then God suddenly reveals himself to them, what happens is, is that our souls literally left our body like a magnetic force, and we all died. That was quite, quite the showstopper if there ever was such a thing. And God had to revive us to bring us back to life by the dew of resurrection. That dew of resurrection, by the way, was Torah. Then um, he spoke the second commandment and the same thing happened. Off of the second commandment, the Jewish people said to Moses, maybe it's a better idea if you tell us the rest of the Ten Commandments and we leave God to, you know, to um, tell it to you directly. So this is what happened. Now, now what happens now is that the Altar Rebbe points out that the fact that God gives us the first two commandments and not the rest is not... By chance, it's actually by divine design. The reason is because God needed to reveal to us only the first two commandments because these first two commandments encapsulate within them every single one of the other commandments. The first commandment, which is, I am God, your God. There is only one God, the belief in one God. That encapsulates within it all the 248 positive mitzvahs. And the second commandment, that the, you shall not serve idols, encapsulates within it all of the 365 passive commandments, the prohibitions. Collectively, they make up 613 commandments, 248 positive, 365 negative. And all the positive commandments are incorporated within the first commandment, I am God, your God, the belief in one God. All the negative commandments are incorporated within the second commandment, you shall have no other gods. And if we can reach a state... Of clarity as to how it is that God that all the positive commandments are incorporated within the first commandment if we could reach a proper understanding of what is God's unity what it means that there is only one God your entire perception of Judaism will be totally different your entire perception of reality will be totally different And that's what we're doing now in today's Tanya class. See, when we say that God is the only God, what does that actually mean? How do you understand that? And again, folks, please post your comments, questions, critique on the side over here. I'd really appreciate it. It would be very helpful to uh, know that I'm connecting with you and that you're understanding what I'm saying or not. If uh, you were to tell me what we're talking uh, you know, your comments and feedback as to um, what I'm saying. So I would love to hear from you. Hi, Jill. Nice to see you, Jill Fanara. Pleasure to have you studying with us. Um, and Nick, uh, Nicole Feldman, N Nicole English. Great to have you with us. Rosa, hi. Um, okay, so what does it mean that we believe in one God? Does that mean that God is the only God? Does that mean that we don't believe in Zeus and Hercules and Buddha and any other God? No. It is obvious that there is no other God other than the creator of the universe. To think that somehow I could have created, um, I could have taken a piece of stone and fashioned it into an idol and to say that this is a God also is nothing short of stupid. It is immature. It's absurd. It's ridiculous. To think that I can take money or the U.S. Stock Exchange and worship it. You know, some people worship their cars. They worship their Mercedes-Benz. To them, their car is their God. You know, they would throw their mother-in-law under the bus for their car or for their business or for their development, right? That is a form of idolatry, right? No, you don't really believe in their power. You just, 
you know, you just sort of put your trust in, you know, the question is, what do you put your trust in? Right? In, on the US dollar, it says in God we trust. But there are people that trust in their lawyers. There are people that trust in their man in the White House. Some people trust in President Trump, we trust. Or in President Obama, we trust. There are many of us um, amongst us that believe that everything will be okay because we have our man in the White House or not. Um, in Sanders or in Biden, we trust. How many people trust in their doctor? How many people trust in their business or in their real estate investments? This, friends, is idolatry. You're not allowed to trust in anything other than the creator of the universe. If you trust in anything other than God, that is idolatry. I know it's a tough pull to swallow, but it's important to have this conversation because the moment we have this conversation, you're able to come to a realization to put things into perspective. Remember what it was like in 2008? Was it December 2008, that night that we found out about Bernie Madoff? And all these people that thought that they were millionaires soon discovered that they were paupers because the man that they trusted in betrayed them. You cannot trust in any human being. You cannot trust in any physical entity. The only entity you can trust in is in God Almighty, who is number one, almighty, number two is just, and number three is kind, almighty, just, and kind. Any other entity, like your doctor, your lawyer, your politician, your country, your nationality, your passport, your currency, all of that is neither almighty, nor just, nor kind. And at some point, they will betray you. Not because they want to, but just because that's their nature. You know, um, the, the, the belief in one God means that we trust only in Hashem and that we believe, not only do we believe that there are no other gods. That's obvious. It is obvious that there are no other gods besides for, God, for Hashem. The belief in one God, however, in Jewish philosophy is that not only is there no other gods, but actually that nothing else exists besides for God. Now that's pretty intense. Not only are there no other gods, that's obvious that there's no other gods. That is obvious, folks. What this means is that nothing exists outside of God because God is the only entity, the only being that exists. Now, why is that, that God is the only being that exists? It's very simple. You see, God created this world from nothing. From nothing, he created something. This is the story of the six days of creation. Now, the nature of everything is to return to its natural state of being. I think we can all agree that everything wants to be in a state of rest. It wants to return to its natural state of being. A, an employee wants to rest. A stone thrown up in the air wants to be laying on the ground. An elastic band which you pull tight wants to go to a state of relaxation. Everything wants to return to a state of relaxation, to its natural state of being. So when you take nothing which we don't know what that is, by the way, because we live in this physical world. When, when God took nothing and he turned it into something, what that means is, is that the nothing has now become a something. It actually wants to return to a state of nothing. The only reason that this world does not return to its natural state of nothingness is only because God continues to create that object at every single moment in time. Just like me holding an elastic band tight. The elastic band wants to return to a state of relaxation. The only reason it stays tight is because I keep on keeping it tight. If I was to leave go, it would go back to a state of, not, uh, to a state of relaxation. So too, the nothingness which, from which this world is created started in a state of nothingness and it is now in a state of somethingness of isness, only because God is forcing it to stay in a state of creative, uh, in a state of somethingness.
But if God was to leave it for even a moment, it would return to a state of nothingness. And this, my friends, is the Hasidic doctrine of perpetual creation. It is an absolute game-changing perspective on reality that reduces all your fear and anxiety to zero. When you realize, when you meditate upon this idea, how everything is created by God from a state of nothing to a state of something at every single moment in time, and when you meditate upon the fact that if God wanted to destroy this world, all that God would do is to leave go, is to stop creating. God doesn't need to destroy the world if he wanted to. All that God needs to do is to cease working. It's just a stop. If we were to realize that all that God needs to do is to stop creating the world, you'd realize that coronavirus doesn't scare me and Hamas and Hezbollah doesn't scare me. And the Dow Jones losing, I don't know what, 25 or 30 percent doesn't scare you. Because God is in control at every single moment in time. If I'm sitting here at this instant, it means that God is creating me and you right here, right now, all over again from scratch. This is the doctrine of perpetual creation. Now, there's only one being that is able to create, and that is God Almighty. Nothing else is able to create because what makes God God is the fact that he always was, always is, and always will be. Like we say in Adon Olam, He was, he is, and he always will be. In fact, by the way, the name of God, the name that we're not allowed to say, God has many names, we'll talk about the many names of God in our prayer and meditation course um, coming up soon. More info to follow. But the name of God, which is, we're not allowed to say, is uh, Yud, and then a He, and then a Vav, and then a He. That name, which the witnesses use to describe themselves, we're not allowed to say that. That name is made up of three words, past, present, and future. Haya, Hove, and Yihye. If you take those three words in one, past, present, future, Haya, Hove, Yihye, you make up the name of God because the name of God is an entity that always was, is, and always will be. No other entity always was, is, and will be. In fact, if, if it was, then it would be God. That is God. We're talking about the same thing. But no created being is able to create anything. So there's only one primordial force that the prime force, the prime creator of anything, of everything is God. Which therefore leads us to conclude this doctrine of perpetual creation and leads us to re come to the realization that not only is there no other gods, of course there's no other gods. It leads us to conclude that nothing else exists without God. They cannot exist anything outside of God's creative force. So just to summarize, if you've just joined us, I'm just going to summarize. We're studying today the book of Tanya, which is the, uh, this is the author, the Alter Rebbe, founder of the Chabad movement 250 years ago. Tanya is the founding text of Chabad philosophy. And we live, breathe, eat, sleep this book, any Chabadnik knows this book like backwards and forwards and we breathe it and meditate it and think about it all of the time. We dive in with it. It inspires us. It gives us purpose and direction all the time. So there's three levels over here. You might be struggling with whether there is a God altogether, right? If I told you that this phone um, has no maker, this phone just came out, you know, I threw some, some sticks and stones in the barbecue you and then this phone jumped out completely with all of my contacts. You tell me that I'm making it up and I'm being absurd and I'm being ridiculous. Obviously, this phone has a designer and an architect that made it, right? If that is ridiculous to say that this phone has no maker, it is many, 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 many more times ridiculous to say that this entire exquisite universe has no maker. So to say that this world has no maker is nothing short of idiotic. It's, it's, Stupid to say that the world has no maker, has no designer. Just like you couldn't say about dinner that you ate last night that it just didn't have a cook. It just made itself. Obviously, it had a cook. So to this world, doesn't just happen by itself. It was created by God. However, the question now is, how many gods? So Chabad, uh, sorry, the, the Ten Commandments tells us I am God, your God, and I am the only God. That's the first two. First commandment is I am God, your God. Number two is there are no other gods besides for me. Right? So 
so the, the belief in any other gods is ridiculous. It's interesting, you know, the Muslims actually believe in one almighty God as well as the Jews. They believe in one invisible, all-powerful being, which is fascinating. But there are other religions that believe in idols, and they worship idols. If you worship an idol, that is idolatry. You can't do that. Now, don't think of uh, just Eastern religions that might be worshiping idols. You, you and I might also be worshiping idols. If you put your trust and tranquility in a doctor or in a lawyer or in a vaccine or in a company or in an investment or in a politician, then that is also idolatry. So it's very important for us not to be idol worshippers and to put our trust only, only and exclusively in God. So now that we've come to the realization that there is only one God, we're getting a, a little more clarity in what it means that there is that God exists and God is the uh, the only thing that the only God that exists and the only being that is able to create anything because creation happened when God took nothing and turned it into something. We said that something, the nature of everything wants to return to its natural state of being. So if God took nothing and turned it into something, then that something always wants to return to a state of nothing. The only reason that the something does not return to a state of something is, oh, sorry, the only thing, the reason why the something doesn't return to its natural state of returning back to a state of nothing is only because there's an external force which continues to create it all the time. And that is how, why God creates the universe at all time, every single moment, which means you and me and the room that you're in and everything else is being created by God at every single instant, every single moment all over again. So God is creating you right this second. God is creating me. Wow, what a thought. God believes in me right here, right now. He wants me to do this now. It also means that God wants the coronavirus apparently to be existing right now. And he also wants the market to be doing whatever it might be doing right now. And he also wants Hamas to be doing what they're doing right now. It uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't mean that we understand why that is, but uh, we do know that it is. So that is the doctrine of perpetual creation, that God is creating the universe at every single moment, all the time, afresh. But the belief in one God doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop there to say that God is the only God and that there are no other gods. The, the belief goes one step further to say that not only is God the only God, it also means that God is the only entity that exists. Nothing else exists independently of God. Because the only things that, that exist can only exist because they were created by God and constantly recreated at every single moment by God. If God were to divorce himself from an entity, it would simply cease to exist. Therefore, God is the essence of everything. And this is the Jewish belief in one God. The notion that there are no other gods is, is obvious. That's obvious. It doesn't take an intellectually sophisticated approach to reality to say that Zeus or some other imagined uh, spaghetti monster or Scientology something or other human being is not a god. Obviously, a human being, a mortal, cannot be a god. Obviously, if something has a beginning, it means it is finite. If it is finite, it means it has an end. If it has an end, it is not almighty. It is not all-powerful and not anything which I want to be interested in worshipping. The only thing that I am interested in worshipping is an almighty, all-powerful god. And that is Hashem, the creator of the universe. So now, the, 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 the challenging part, the game-changing part here is when we start to realize that... The belief in one God is not only the belief that there are no other gods, but more specifically that there nothing else exists other than God. So when you look at the world around you, you come to the realization that you have nothing to be afraid of. Because there cannot be anything which is inconsistent with the presence of God. Wow. Yes, it might look like it competes with God, it might look like it's inconsistent with the will of God, but guess what? It's just a test. You know that woman from Israel? She's this first religious Shabbat observant uh, marathon runner, BT something, I forget her name, Betsy Stern or something, I forget her name. So she decided that she qualified for the Olympics in Tokyo, but she decided that she is not going to compete on Shabbos. Guess what happened? It looks to me, I haven't checked the latest, but it looks to me like the whole entire Olympic Games has been canceled or rescheduled um, because of this coronavirus business. At least they're talking about it. She said she's not going to compete on Shabbos. 
because it's not consistent with the observance of Shabbos. In other words, whenever you're faced with a conflict between keeping the law of God and dealing with the rest of the world, it's a test. God is testing you to see the extent of your faith. Does your faith begin and end in the synagogue? Does your faith end at bar mitzvah? Does it end at Hebrew school? Or does it extend to your kitchen? Does your faith extend to your wallet, to your bank account, to your dining room and living room, and to your workplace? That is the big question here about how much of a believer you are. Your belief in one God, does that mean that nothing else exists other than God? And that is the challenge of Tanya chapter 22. Tanya tells us that if you believe that anything exists outside of God, that is idolatry. If you believe that God commanded us to keep Shabbos, but the Olympic Games is subject to a different code, rules and regulations, some other entity called humanity maybe, or the Olympic Committee, that is idolatry. If you believe that President Trump can do something which um, is inconsistent with the will of God, that's idolatry. If you believe that coronavirus can hurt you inconsistent with the will of God, that is idolatry. This is a holistic approach to reality. Every single thing in this universe has an energy, a divine energy within it. This idea would have been very difficult for us to relate to years ago. But today, when we have nanotechnology and the study of uh, micro science, we're able to realize that every single thing that we see around us, whether it's a solid, a liquid, or a gas, is made up of the same atoms. The same atoms, electrons, protons, neutrons. Atoms make up everything. We just can't see it. But there is energy inside of every solid, liquid, and gas, and it's the same energy. The energy in your thoughts is the same energy that's inside the table that you're sitting at right now. The energy in your thought is the same energy in the table that you're sitting at right now. It's just that in the form of a table, it's more condensed. In the form of a thought, it's much more dispersed. Solid, liquid, and gas. It's all made up of the same particles. And godliness in the same way is on an even more subatomic level than even the atoms it is something that creates the table your brain the, t the the chair the house that you're in the white house and the entire universe like it's being created all the time at every single instant and this is a totally mind-blowing perspective on reality if you it's it's like changing your glasses now our tanya is giving us today a brand new set of glasses, like x-ray vision. Right now, whatever I see, I see godliness within it. In fact, there was the Alter Rebbe, the author of the Tanya, here is a picture of him, it was the Alter Rebbe, here he is again, the Alter Rebbe who says, when he was on his deathbed, he said, as I look up at the ceiling, I don't see the beam in the ceiling. I see the word of God creating the beam in the ceiling. What an aspiration to reach to be able to reach that kind of a level where you're able to see godliness within everything is extraordinary. It certainly takes away any fear and anxiety that we might be experiencing at any time on a global or on a personal level. And this is the idea that we're going to be developing here in chapter 22 of Tanya. And I just want to conclude with a few closing thoughts here, and that's like this. Anytime we sin, we are violating the will of God. Anytime we do a mitzvah, we're fulfilling the will of God. What that tells us is that any sin is effectively an act of idol worship. Any sin is effectively an act of idol worship. Because if you're going to do something which is inconsistent with the will of God, it means that you're saying, listen, God, you're a nice guy and everything, but I think differently. You say one way, I say another way. 
you've turned yourself into an idol. And in the same way that a Jew would literally give up his life so as not to have, so as not to denounce his faith, your average Jew, if forced to denounce his belief in God or die, your average Jew would rather die. It's this realization of God's unity that helps us realize that actually every single sin that we do, no matter how tiny or how large, is effectively an act of idolatry, a rejection of God's unity. That is Tanya's shortcut method to self-mastery, to helping us find a shortcut method without too much meditation as to how we can master our animalistic, self-centered souls to make sure that our thought, speech, and action is consistent with our godly soul, our purpose-driven soul, as opposed to our pleasure-driven soul. When we simply come to the realization of God's unity, the doctrine of perpetual creation, how nothing exists other than God. God is the essence of everything. And if I commit a single tiny sin, that is a rejection of God's unity. That is effectively idolatry. And in the same way that I would literally give up my life so as not to serve an idol, so as not to bow down to an idol, every little sin is effectively idolatry. When they tell you don't sweat the small stuff, they're actually wrong. Because when it comes to humiliating the king, it makes no difference if you spit in his face or if you speak badly about him. Both actions are a deep insult against the king and effectively treason. So too, if you bow down to an idol, God forbid, or if you just do a little baby sin, you're effectively denying the authority of God upon you the authority of God upon the entity that you're engaging with and you're committing idolatry. It is this approach of God's unity, the doctrine of perpetual creation that inspires us all to be able to enhance our faith, to make sure that our thoughts, speech, and action are consistent, not with our animal soul, the self-centered soul, but with our godly soul, the purpose-driven soul, making sure that we are growing spiritually. That is what Tanya is about, a book, a guide of spiritual growth and more, more of a meaningful relationship with God. Folks, I'm going to sign off over here. But we are going to carry on with Torah study every morning at 8.30 in the morning. And uh, Tanya will be studying on Tuesday mornings at 9.15 every Tuesday morning right here on Facebook Live. And also I want you to know that we are going to be introducing a course on, I'm calling it uh, an introduction to Jewish uh, spirituality and meditation through prayer, which I'm going to be teaching right here on Facebook Live. I have, I'm putting the final touches on it, so stay tuned. Hopefully today I'll have more information. But uh, stay tuned, don't go away, and look out for it in our weekly emails. If you, if you haven't yet subscribed to our emails, you can do so at, um, you can subscribe at jewishgardens.com forward slash subscribe. That's jewishgardens.com forward slash subscribe. And I would love to hear from you if you want to send me your emails at this difficult time. That's to communicate. It's rabbi at jewishgardens.com. That's rabbi at jewishgardens.com. It's been a pleasure studying with you. Thank you very much. We'll see you tomorrow.